what we love to call Resurrection Sunday. Amen. And if it's Resurrection Sunday and we know that Jesus is alive, come on, give him a better praise than that. Give him better praise than that. He's... We know that Jesus is alive. Somebody say amen. Amen. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we want to thank you for such a glorious day as today. For just over 2,000 years ago, Lord, on this very day, you rose again from the dead. You defied all odds of whatever man has tried to do, and you came back from the dead. So, Lord, we want to thank you because we know that you are very much alive, sitting at the right hand of the Father. But yet, Lord, by your Spirit, you dwell within the lives of each of us as believers. And Lord, today, if there's someone that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, today can be the day that they come alive, that they come out of the tomb, that they come to a place of resurrection, even within their own life. We're believing, Lord God, for your Holy Spirit to move freely in this service today. And not only in this sanctuary, Lord, but even those that might be watching online. Touch their hearts, Lord, for wherever they are. Wherever they are, Lord God, let them know how real you are. And for, Lord, all, all of us that are in the sanctuary today, let your presence be so real. Let us feel your touch. Let us feel your blessing, your presence. Lord, we love you today. And today... As believers, we've come to bless you. We've come to worship you. We've come to celebrate Jesus. We've come to celebrate our resurrected Savior. We've come today, Lord, to rise, Lord God, our voices, our hearts, to proclaim that truly Jesus is alive. So, Lord, touch everyone that's watching, everyone that's here in the sanctuary today. Lord, move in such a way, God, that whatever it is that's restraining Lord God, would be broken. Lord, we pray against anything that the enemy, our adversary, the devil, would try to do to distract. Lord God, to disturb. Lord, we just rebuke anything of his strategy right now in Jesus' name. We pray for everything to move and flow freely and smoothly so that, God, all of our lives would be touched and our, our concentration would be upon you. So this morning, Lord, we're just praying for your anointing, your presence. Lord God, to touch the worship team as they lead us, the choir, as they sing from their hearts, move, Lord God, in such a way that the people around us, that we can feel the energy in the room. So that, Lord God, we know that we're in one accord to lift up the name of Jesus. Somebody say Jesus this morning. Jesus. It's all about you, Lord. It's all about you. We came to proclaim and lift up the name of Jesus, the name above all names. In Jesus' name we pray. And can everybody say amen? Amen. amen. Let's worship the Lord. Give him the Lord one more praise offering this morning. Come on. Amen.
Lord, even with all this excitement, we remember what you did on Calvary. Oh 
Can I share a scripture with you? Amen. This is found in the book of Colossians. And it says in chapter 1, verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things, somebody say all things, that's why we're singing Jesus is over everything, all things, say it again, you guys got to remember that Jesus is king over all things, and all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Can somebody say amen? amen. He is Lord over all things. I think we can sing that one more time. Amen. Jesus is Lord over all things. Can we say all things? Can you do that this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we're so glad you're with us this morning. Amen. If you're visiting for the very first time, we just want to say welcome to each and every one of you. Amen. And those of you part of Agape, I want you just to go out of your way to show them how much we call ourselves a love They church. killed my son! They killed my son! Would I, would I have agreed? 
<laughs> would I have said yes if I knew what I was going to feel now? <laughs> so, if he could be sick. Oh. <laughs> a good baby. He hardly ever cried. He was so good. I remember when he was eight days old and we took him to the temple. As was required by the law, we were fulfilling the customs of the law and we went into the temple and a man by the name of Simeon, a devout and righteous man, who the Holy Spirit was upon had told him to go to the temple that day and the Holy Spirit had shared with him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ and I walked in the temple that day and he was there and he burst into tears and he came over and he took the baby from me and he just talked to him and held him and talked to him and, and wept and he told me that the rise and fall of many would be upon my son and the thoughts of many hearts would be revealed in Israel. <laughs> and when he handed him back to me, he said, and a sword will pierce your soul also. I don't think I knew what that meant until today. He was such a good baby. Oh, when he was a toddler, he would talk nonstop, but only about one subject. Nonstop, all day long, all day long, with the finger. Mama, I just love God the Father. Mama, do you love God the Father? Yes, son, I love God the Father. Mama, I'm so glad you love God the Father. What is God the Father doing right now, Mama? I don't know what he's doing right now. Let's go talk to God the Father all day long. <laughs> and when James was born, put him, he'd be there in his little cradle, and Jesus would just sit with him for hours and talk to him and tell him all about God the Father. He was such a good boy. He was so sensitive and tender and loving. He couldn't stand for anything to be hurt or wounded. He couldn't even stand it when my herb garden would wilt. It just, anything that wasn't right bothered him. My son. When we were 12, when he was 12, not when we were 12, when he was 12, we went to Jerusalem for the Passover, and we were there for a few days. We always traveled in the caravan with people. You know, everybody knew everybody. He was so social. He never met a person that he couldn't talk to. Eh, 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 God the Father. And he would, so as we were coming back at the caravan, I just assumed he was with Joseph or somebody else. Joseph assumed he was with me or somebody else. And it was, we were, gosh, a day and a half, two days into the journey before we realized he wasn't even with us. Oh my gosh, I have never known such panic in my life. Joseph and I rushed back to Jerusalem as fast as we could get there, as quick as we could get there, and we searched for three days. We looked for my son, 
finally when he entered the temple courts and there he was and he was just sitting and listening and, and talking and questioning, questioning and absorbing everything that the teachers of the law had to say. And they were amazed by him, a 12-year-old, the knowledge that he had and, and how he had just could understand and grasp everything. They were, they were just in awe of him, and I think he was in awe of them and all he was learning. And as we were heading back, I was like, Jesus, how could you do that to us? I, I was scared. I was frantic. I was so nervous. And he just looked at me and he said, Mama, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Something changed after that trip. Something changed after that trip. He was like, he had grown up. He had, he had matured. He had such a level of, of understanding. He still had that, that sweet heart and that love for for people and the, the, and he wanted to talk to everybody and no matter where he went he would he would share things with people and I started noticing that you know if my herbs were wilted he would just breathe on them and they would perk back up if he walked by a grapevine that was that was not doing too good he would just touch it and it would it would be restored to its strength and the little lame calf that ran through our neighborhood he would just pick it up and pet it and it wouldn't be lame anymore. He was starting just to have this, this strength about him. It was just, I, he was just changing. And it was just, it was just building in him. But the biggest change came that I could physically see. And I knew that the world would never be the same. when he went to seek out his cousin, John the Baptist, and he wanted to be baptized. And as he was approaching him, John said, Behold, the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world. And everybody, and, and all the disciples, John's disciples and people were there. Jesus came home that day after John baptized him in the river, and he told me, he said, Mama, when I came up out of the water, he said, the heavens opened, and God the Father said, that is my son, in whom I am well pleased. And after that, he started just, people started following, he started calling his own disciples, Every time he called a disciple, he would bring them home from dinner, bring them home for dinner, and oh my goodness, Peter could eat. He was the biggest eater. John was the pickiest eater. Uh, Nathaniel had to ask what was in every recipe, because he wasn't going to, oh. That. But he would bring, him, bring them all home, and he started having a, the, these, he had his inner circle of 12. But he had lots of people that were following him. He was teaching constantly. and No matter where he went, Miracles were happening, and, and, and people were being healed, and the lame were made to walk, and the blind were made to see, and he had the most unorthodox way of doing things. I would say, Jesus, please, can you figure out something more sanitary? The blind man, he spits in the dirt, makes the mud, and puts it on his eyes. I'm like, son. But the blind man could see, and that's all that mattered. And you know, I have to tell you, the, the very first time I remember was, was we went to a wedding. We went to a lot of weddings. I think this one was in Canaan. And they ran out of wine. And that's embarrassing. I mean, you guys know Jewish custom. And you never want to run out of anything, much less wine. And so I told, I can't remember which one, but I told somebody, go get Jesus. I need Jesus. And um, he came to me and I said, son, they ran out of wine. And he said, mama, why are you troubling me with this? You know, and I said, son, because I know. I know that you will know what to do. And off I went and there were some big washing jars there, some jars, huge jars of water. And, and the next thing I know, everybody in the entire wedding is talking about the amazing wine that they saved the best for last. And I knew, and he knew, that I knew that he had done a miracle. 
And that was just it. He just did what was right, what would make, what would make people happy. And I think if I wrote down all, all the miracles, all the good I saw him do, there wouldn't be enough paper in the world to hold a journal telling you how good my son was, how loving and caring, costing problems too. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were jealous of him. Instead of embracing his goodness and embracing what he could do and doesn't want a child that can't walk to walk or a blind person to see or a deaf man to hear. But they didn't like it. And I think the one of his last miracles was probably the final straw. He was very, very good friends with Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. He, loved them so much, spent so much time with them, and <clears throat> Lazarus got sick, really sick, and Mary and Martha, you know, told, you know, sent for Jesus, but he didn't get there before Lazarus died, and when he got there, they were just so distraught, they were, you know, Jesus, if only you had been here, and, and he said, no, Lazarus went to him, went to him, said, Lazarus, come out! And here came Lazarus all in his grave clothes. It was kind of a, he's walking like this. <laughs> but he raised Lazarus from the dead. And when the Pharisees heard about this, they started looking for ways to kill him. They were so jealous and they found a way. Less than, less than a week ago, yeah, less than a week ago, he was coming into town, riding into Jerusalem for Passover Sunday, coming into town, and he was riding on a donkey, and, and people were laying down, throwing down their cloaks in front of him like he was a king to ride in, you know, who, you can't ride in on dirt when you're a king, and they were laying their coats <clears throat> along the roadway, and the women have palm branches that they were waving, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, and praising him and putting shade on him and doing everything they could to, to worship him. I think that was on Sunday. And then on Thursday, he, had, he told the disciples, you know, to, there was a place that he wanted to have a meal with them. He wanted them to prepare the, the Passover supper. And you know mom, she's always got to be there to help. They got everything all set up, but I was kind of in the background. I was in the kitchen kind of doing those little final touches because only I know how to feed Peter and John, those two picky eaters. And they were, but they had everything set up. And I was just kind of in the background, just listening, and I heard them all starting to arrive. They were all talking and laughing and visiting with each other and greeting each other and, and as, as they were arriving and st starting to get themselves settled. And, and then Jesus said he was going to wash their feet. And Peter said, oh, no, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. And Peter, God, Jesus told him, Peter, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, I'm serving you. I'm teaching you how to serve others. If you don't allow me to wash your feet, you're not a part of me. And Peter said, then wash my head and my shoulders and my whole body and all of me. He said, Peter, just relax. And he washed all of his disciples' feet. And then they sat down to have dinner. And I heard my son tell them that one of them would betray him and one of them 
would deny him. And of course, you could hear as they're all wondering who's who. But he knew. And he broke bread with them and told them that to eat this, that the bread symbolized his body, to do that in remembrance of him. And then he gave them all wine and told them he would not drink of the wine again until he saw them all in eternity. Judas left, had somewhere to go, something to do. When dinner was finished, it was late. And Jesus wanted to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. That was his favorite place to pray to God the Father. He had asked the disciples to go with him. You know, it just now, just now dawned on me. That was the last supper. last time they were all together. It was the last time he would be in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was the last time I would see his beautiful hands not bruised and covered in blood. last times I would see his beautiful eyes not swollen shut or full of blood it's a lot of laughs you know me doting mother. They all left for the garden. And I finished cleaning up a few things, put a few things away in the kitchen, and then I went to the garden too. I stood off to the side by a rock. And I could see he took Peter, James, and John with him, asked him to pray. And he went further into the garden. And I, he was just it was almost as if it took every bit of his energy to walk. He was so burdened with something. And he walked, as he got a little bit away from the disciples, he just fell on the ground. With crying out to God the Father. And I heard him say, Oh, Father, if it be your will, would you take this cup from me? But not my will, your will be done. And he was just, he was like sweating and almost like blood was dripping from him. He was just overwhelmed with grief and anguish. And he got up and he went to see him, and Peter and James and John had fallen asleep and he woke him up and he said, please, please, I need you. I need you, my friends, please pray. And he went back into the garden. Do you see? And I could see his lips moving, but I couldn't hear him. I knew he was talking to God the Father. I knew he was crying out. A second. And again, they fell asleep, and finally he Look, the hour is here. I could see off in the distance a bunch of torches, and I thought, my goodness, what is that? Is that the, are those the Roman soldiers? What, what is happening? It's the middle of the night. 
And as they approached, it wasn't the Roman soldiers. It was some of the Pharisees, some of the Sadducees, some of, the, some of their temple guards were there. And then just a, like a mob of people. And they were so angry. And I actually recognized a few of them. Remember the cloak, cloak throwing that was going on? People that were laying down their cloaks a couple days earlier were now, now had, had swords and swords and, and torches and, and clubs. And, and they, were coming, they were coming to arrest him. You are never going to guess what I saw next. Judas was in the front of the crowd. He had my Judas, Jesus' Judas, the Judas that had sat at our dinner table that I cooked for so many times. He was in the front of the crowd, and he walked up. And he kissed Jesus on the cheek. And as soon as he kissed Jesus on the cheek, mayhem just broke out. People started swinging their swords and pounding their clubs and screaming. And they were hurling insults and calling names and saying profane words. And people were grinding. They were pulling my son, putting ropes around him. At one point, he fell on the ground. I stumbled to the ground. They picked him back up, and they were hitting him and slapping him, slapping him and and. Peter took out his sword and he swung one of the temple guards and he said, he cut his ear off and Jesus said, stop, stop. And he said, Peter, put your sword away. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And then he took a torch from, and he looked and he found that guard's ear. And he picked it up. And he placed it back on. And restored. And the man's ear to perfect health. You would think somebody would be grateful. You'd think they'd be amazed. You'd think they'd be appreciative. Do you know what they did? They spit in his face. And the whole thing started again. The screaming, the yelling, the, the ropes. The, and Jesus said, temple every day. Do what you have to do. Oh, the longest night. The longest night. Do you realize that over the next 18 hours, there would be six, I count them, six, not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, six illegal, every one of them illegal, six illegal trials would take place that night. And when all was said and done, my son would be found. God, the man who knew no sin, be guilty of what? First three trials, Ananias, Caiaphas, and the, the, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, they had found people to give false witness against Jesus, to lie about him, to make up stories about him so that they would have an evidence to take him to Pilate to be crucified because they had no power to do that wasn't in the Jewish law, but they had enough, found enough falsehood against my son, and he did. He ended up before Pilate. 
Pilate found no fault in him. So he sent him to Herod. What a silly man to have so much power. Do you know what he wanted? He wanted Jesus to do a miracle. He wanted to see a miracle, like a little puppet on a string. That wasn't my son. <clears throat> that, wasn't, that wasn't how he worked. And that wasn't the purpose of miracles, to show off. But that's what Herod wanted. And when Jesus didn't give him what he wanted, they sent him back to Pilate. Pilate still could find no, no reason to find him guilty of anything, but to satisfy the, the mob, to satisfy the mob. He had him flogged. Do you wonder where all the Jesus' disciples were right now? They'd all scattered. They were scared. I didn't blame them. I was scared. But we know that Judas was the one that betrayed him. And when they went to Ananias' house, John was able to go inside. He, he knew some people there. And Peter remained outside in the courtyard. And not once, and not twice, but three times, he denied knowing Jesus. Jesus had told him this would happen. He had told him, Peter, Satan had asked to see if he was wheat. He said, but before, and Peter had said, Lord, I will never deny you. He had said, before the rooster crows tonight, you will deny me three times. Before, and then the rooster will crow. Peter was out in the courtyard. Poor thing, it just broke my heart. <clears throat> Once, twice, third time, a young girl said, I know you, you were with Jesus. He said, at that time, he didn't use the swear word. He said, no. I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> you could just see the devastation on Peter's face that he ran. He ran from the courtyard, brokenhearted. He'd always tried so to be so strong. And when push came to shove, he failed to say. I was there. Oh, please make it stop. Make it stop. Make it stop. <laughs> you can't imagine what I could hear. I mean, you could hear screaming and yelling and insults, and you could hear the cracks of whips and and I, it sounded like rocks being broke against on, on stones. And I, I don't know what was going on behind that wall. It sounded, like, it sounded like the chariot races or the gladiators. It sounded like they were at, at, at some event. They were cheering and carrying on. When they brought my son back around the wall after the flogging and presented him to Pilate, he was unrecognizable. He, he didn't even, you couldn't, he didn't even look human. Was, there was not a piece of his body that wasn't cut and torn 
and bruised and bleeding. His eyes were swollen shut. His blood was coming from his ears. My beautiful son. My beautiful baby. They beat him just within an inch of his life. And finally, Pilate gave in. What, what more do you people want? And they started chanting, Crucify him! Crucify him! And he said, Do you want Jesus or Barabbas? And they started chanting, Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. So Pilate made the decision to let a criminal go free and to condemn an innocent man to death. His cross was huge. It was splintery wood. Put it on his torn up back for him to carry it. He was so weak. As he was carrying his cross, I was running alongside, trying to keep up, trying to keep up. And I felt like I was screaming and I don't know if he, he couldn't hear me because all the blood in his ears or if there was really nothing coming out of my mouth. I don't know. And I was telling him, God the Father, call on God the Father. Jesus, call God the Father to help you. Call him, come down and help you. He'll send you the legions of angels. Call on God the Father. But he just kept plodding with the cross. Finally, a man came to help him. I was running along. At one point, he fell down. And as they were lifting the cross back up, there was a man next to me. People were throwing stones. He had this huge rock in his hand. I turned and I looked at him. I said, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Look at, look at him. He can't even walk. He's beaten within an inch of his life, and you feel the need to throw a rock at him? What is wrong with you? And he just shoved me aside. <laughs> Brushed myself off and kept going. I was not going to leave my son's side. <sighs> we finally oh, arrived at Golgotha. You've never seen such cruelty in your life. They laid him down on that cross. Outstretched hands. A spike so big. his hands and through the cross took like a sledgehammer the biggest hammer you've ever seen just to hit that nail it wasn't a nail both hands and his feet he never made a never cried out. They rose him up in the air. Yeah. 
placed a crown of thorns on him earlier. If he leaned his head back for rest, just drive the thorns into his head. He tried with all his might to hold his head up. He was crucified between two criminals. One of them was hurling insults at him, saying all kinds of things to him. If you're really the son of God, take us down, take us with you. If you're really who they say you are. He was trying to get his friend on the other side to join him. And the thief on the other side told him, we deserve this. We deserve this punishment. This man has done nothing wrong. And he turned and he looked at Jesus. And he said, Remember me. Remember me when you enter your kingdom. And my son, Your sins are forgiven. Today, you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> he said he was thirsty. And they dipped the sponge in some vinegar and wine and held it up to his lips. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then he looked down. I swear he looked right at me. And he said, It is finished. Head dropped to his chest, and he was gone. My son was gone. being ever so practical. The Pharisees knew that the Sabbath was coming and they wanted the bodies off the cross before the day of preparation. So they told the soldiers to break the legs of those hanging. And when they came to my son, they realized he was already dead. They stuck a spear in his side and the water rushed out. And the soldier said, Surely, this is the Son of God. Joseph of Arimathea had asked Pilate if he could have his body. He bought new linen cloths, and when they took him off the cross, he took him. He was going to take him and put him in a new tomb.
and they took him down. I just ran to him. I lifted his head and put it in my lap. took off the thorns, the crown of thorns. And I just brushed his blood-soaked hair through my fingers. Finally, John said, forgot something. All of nature cried for my son. The earth shook. The veil was torn in two. There was a great earthquake. Oh, the whole sky went dark for hours. Oh, help me, Lord. All I have left are my memories, and I'm already forgetting things. It's all I have left. Please let me remember. <laughs> oh. I'm so tired. I just need to sleep. Just for Let me sleep for a while. What? Who is it? What? What time is it? Oh. That was Mary Magdalene. She says it's 9 a.m. on Sunday. I must have slept longer than I thought. She, she said she had just come from the tomb. The Pharisees had actually asked that the tomb be sealed because they were afraid that Jesus' words would come true, that he would rise from the dead, and that people would say that somebody would really just kill, come and steal his body. But she said the tomb, it wasn't sealed. The stone was rolled away. And she ran, and when she went inside, she went inside, and there was two angels sitting there. And there were the grave cloths, but his body wasn't in them. And they said to her, Why do you look for the living? among the dead. And I ran outside, and she ran outside. She said she was so confused, she didn't know what to do, and she met the gardener. And she asked the gardener, she said, please, please, just tell me, just tell me what you've done with his body. Please tell me what you've done with his body. I prepared all these spices. Please, just tell me where you've put him. And he said, Mary. And the moment he spoke her name, she knew that it was Christ the Lord. He had risen just as he said he would. And he told her to go back to town to tell the disciples. Peter and John had already been there and raced off before her, but she stopped at my house to tell me what had happened. She said, Mary, you've got to go. You've got to go. You've got to go see the empty tomb. She ran back. I have to tell you, I'm not quite sure what I think right now. I'm not quite sure how to feel right now. But I do know that there's a back pathway. I'm just going to take that back pathway. 
peek around and see for myself. And while this path is kind of covered with a bunch of overgrown bushes and shrubs, but I still know where I'm headed. Up ahead, there's a man sitting on a rock. Hi, Mama. My son is alive. Before I go, I wanted to just talk with you and tell you a few things. <laughs> he said, they didn't kill me. I willingly went to the cross. I willingly laid down my life. I willingly took on the sins of the entire world <laughs> so that man could be forgiven of sin and not have to make a sacrifice every year. <laughs> Mama, I am the perfect lamb without spot or blemish. The veil has been torn. Never again. And then he told me, he said, Before I go, I want you to know how much I love you. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for agreeing to be my mom. Because none of this would have been possible without you, for it's all God's perfect plan to restore humanity to him. I was born to die. <laughs> and you were part of that. God's perfect plan has been fulfilled. We have defeated death. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. He will sit on the throne next to his Father forevermore. And we will someday be in eternity with him because he is the risen Savior and the risen King. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, so come on somebody. Give him praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Can you stand? Come on, let's give God's praise this morning. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a journey Sister Kimberly took us on. Amen. Reminding us what happened in that last week and through the life of Christ. You know, this morning, before we end, I want to just share just a few verses of Scripture. It won't take long. But I want us to remember exactly why we are here, and it's all because of the blood of Jesus. Can somebody say amen? amen. You know, can I share just a, a few verses of scriptures with you as you're standing? The Bible says... In 1st Timothy chapter 2 verses 5 through 6 5 and 6 for there is one God and one mediator between God and men it's the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all men the testimony given in its proper time can I read that one more time for there is only one God 
and one mediator, just one, which is between God and men, and it's the man Christ Jesus. Let me share this with you. There's an image I want us to see. Sister Kelly, can you put that for me? There's an image that because of sin, there was a separation, a separation between us and God, man and God. That separation can only have been filled through the person, the mediator, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ became the bridge. Go ahead, Kelly, show me that. He became the bridge because of the cross. And because of the blood that he shed, you and I have an opportunity to cross over from this life to the next. That's Bible. That's Bible. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And so when we see that Jesus going to the cross paid for the sins of all mankind. You see, every one of us here today, we were born sinners. Every one of us. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. We needed that bridge. We needed Jesus to get across because if we choose not to receive him, not to believe in him, the Bible says in 623 of that same book of Romans, the wages of sin is death. That's a consequence. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, here's the perfect plan. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So we can praise God that he, he paid that price. You see, what sometimes people don't want to accept and don't want to believe, but this is the reality. Ke Kelly, can you show me that third slide? You see, Jesus is the bridge. The cross is the way across. The blood that Jesus shed for us, because if not that great chasm, it's a place called hell. And without Christ, that is the destiny of every single person who rejects Jesus. That's truth, my friend. That's truth. You see, so Jesus gave his life, shed his blood so that I can be saved. I love the song that they sang earlier on thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Because it says in the lyrics of that song that he was, we are able to cross over the chasm, that chasm of destruction. I want to ask him to sing that for us one more time and we can sing it with him in thanksgiving. Amen. And then I want to encourage you, if you do not know Jesus, today's a day that you can say, I want to give my life to Christ. I want to, I believe and I want to receive Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, your destiny, I got to be honest with you, unfortunately it is hell. But Jesus paid the price on the cross through the shedding of his blood so that you can escape that judgment. If you don't know Jesus, it's not about going to church. It's not just about believing there is a God. You must know Him. You see, the Bible says in John, the first chapter, verse 12, but as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to be called children of God. To those who believe, though, to those who receive, and that's how you're saved. You see, Jesus is ready to come into your life if those of you that are here this morning don't know Him. I'm going to challenge you. Today's a great day to say, I want to receive Jesus. I want to receive the blood applied over my life. I want to receive Jesus so that I can be saved by the blood that he shed for me. Would you close your eyes? Lord, thank you so much for walking us through the journey through my sister Kimberly as she portrayed Mary, mother of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that it reminds us, Lord, all that you went through pain, the suffering, the agony, all because you loved us. You could have easily said no, but God, you went all the way to the cross and you shed the blood that washes our sins away. Today, Lord, there may be somebody that wants to give their hearts to you 
And Lord, we want them to know that today's the day of salvation. Today's the day they can receive Christ as their Savior. Today's the day they can just open their hearts and say, Jesus, come into my life. If that's you here this morning, I know many of you might be believers already, but there might be somebody here. You're not here by accident. You're here because God loves you, and God wanted you to hear this message. He wants to save you. Jesus wants to be your Savior. If that's you here this morning, right where you are, would you raise your hand? Would you raise your hand right where you are? Amen. Praise God. Amen. I, I, I'm not sure if uh, it's kind of dark in here. Uh, can you just lift the lights just a little? I see some hands now. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Is there anybody else that wants to give your life to Jesus Christ? Amen. Let's pray this prayer. And I'll tell you, when you pray this prayer, you're praying it to the Father. And then afterwards, I'm going to ask you to come. Let me, let me congratulate you. Let me welcome you into the family of God. And not this church, but to the kingdom of God. Amen. Father, I'm going to thank you for the hands that were raised and for the hearts that were touched here this morning. And Holy Spirit, I know that it's through your regeneration process, what you do spiritually to bring new life. And Lord, right now, as they pray this prayer, we're going to pray that with them, Lord God, that they would receive you as their personal Savior, that they would understand that it's not by our works or anything we could do, but just by our faith and putting our faith and trust in you, believing and receiving, and then just choosing to follow Jesus. Would you pray this prayer with me? Let's pray this prayer together. Maybe you're here this morning, and it's a simple prayer, but it's got to be through brokenness and repentance to say, I'm going to leave my old life, and I'm going to choose to follow Jesus. Pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I am a sinner. I am lost. I need a Savior. I'm asking you to be my Savior and be my Lord. I'm going to turn away from my life of sin, and I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow that path of righteousness to be obedient to you all the days of my life. So come into my heart. I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Help me to grow. Help me to understand. Help me to know your heart and to love you so much more. I receive you now by faith in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.